Hello, everyone, and welcome to, to tonight's presentation of OTF Connects, making student, oh, I did a typo, <laughs> making student thinking visible. How can technology help? With Brenda Sherry and Peter Skillen. Uh, we're very grateful for your presence here tonight, and on behalf of Sirius Gerhand and everyone at OTF, um, uh, Sirius, the administrator and facilitator for this program, uh, we really appreciate that you're giving up some of your own time to uh, to learn some more things, especially with the uh, uh, March break coming up. I know everyone's attention's on a lot of uh, relaxation and catching up with family and all that kind of stuff. So we're really glad you're here tonight. And um, here's our little visual of where everyone is tonight. And then we've got one of our participants in Guangzhou, China right now, which is really terrific, too. Uh, we love that you're uh, continuing to access all this PD while you're there. And let's see. So if anyone runs into any technical difficulties, let me know in the chat. And I'll just draw your attention again to the little symbols next to your name. If you see little yellow boxes or red boxes, that means there's a bit of a lag. But it will catch up, especially with the sound. And, and not to worry, occasionally you get bumped out of the session, but Blackboard should log you right back in again. If it doesn't, you can go back to the link in your email and start over. It is a 90-minute session, so usually you don't lose too much time if that happens. So thank you again, and I'm going to push one more slide forward there and hand it over to Brenda and Peter. Thank you so much, Louise, and welcome to everybody. Um, and especially Elisa, Alicia, who's starting her day from China. That's pretty awesome. I'm always in awe of the fact that we can learn this way and connect together, even all around the world. So that's very exciting. So in a minute, I'm going to ask uh, Peter to introduce himself and get us started. But what I'd like to do is ask you folks to let us know where you're from in the chat and what you're teaching, and perhaps if you've attended any of the OTF webinars before. So. Why don't you do that while we, I let uh, Peter start us off and introduce himself. Peter? Thank you, Brenda. Welcome, everybody. And one more thing, if you've attended one of our sessions in particular uh, at OTF Connect, that would be of interest to us just so that we are aware of you know, things we might cover this time versus what we've covered before, So, because there are always overlaps. So my name is Peter, and I um, I started teaching in 1970, and I started teaching elementary school, and I taught elementary school for about 13 years, and then moved into the computers and education department, because that's when computers were sort of coming on the scene. Um, but my interest wasn't in computers particularly, it was in cognition and how kids really think and how technology can, can leverage uh, thinking, and mostly thinking about thinking. Um, so I did that until the year 2000, and then uh, retired and went off to uh, Montreal. Actually, I lived in Toronto, went off to Montreal to work, uh, developing a piece of uh, collaborative journal writing software that really focuses on uh, making thinking visible. Um, and then when that was done in 2003, the YMCA of Greater Toronto started a secondary school and uh, hired myself and a few others to get it up and running. And so I worked with secondary students uh, for about eight years. Um, and uh, again, brought this whole notion of uh, making student thinking visible to those classes. So I've experienced all across that range. And now, actually, I'm still working at the YMCA of Greater Toronto, trying to get the staff setting up a, a, an online environment for them uh, so they can make, so we can make all our work uh, transparent and, uh, and visible throughout the organization in ways that are different from sort of the top-down push of information out to folks across an intranet. So, so that's uh, that's a whirlwind of forty-something years right there. Uh, Brenda. Thanks, Peter. Um, hi, Leslie, and everyone else. Now I know that it's Leslie Borkamp there. I think uh, I'm going to out you because <laughs> I think that's who it is. It's fun. It's fun when we're trying to guess who people are because we're not always sure. Um, without a last name. So thanks, Peter. Um, my name is Brenda Sherry. I'm a technology itinerant technology coach in Upper Grand District, which is Guelph, Orangeville, Mount Forest, Aberfoyle, pretty big, pretty big bo um, boards out by Guelph. And so my role, um, I, I spent 20 years in the classroom, and now the last six or so I've been uh, helping teachers who'd like to in integrate technology into their classrooms. So I plan with them and go into their classrooms and work with kids, and it's really a lot of fun. 
Um, so we're here, I guess, um, to talk about visible, making thinking visible. And one of the things that we wanted to do was get started with um, an, a, a little, very short video about the, a culture of thinking. And because we're going to present some of the ideas tonight from visiblethinking.org, uh, this is sort of a recent book that we've both been reading and we've been inspired by how it connects to other things that we we know about uh, using technology and learning with kids. So we've, we've, we're going to share some of those uh, today with you, but we thought we would start off with a little video. I'm going to ask Peter actually to pull it up as a web tour, or should I do that? Let me just see. I'm going to pop the link in the, in the chat. This will be if it does not work for you, okay? So you'll, you'll have that link to, you, to look at. I'm going to put it in a web tour right now, and what will happen is, as soon as it opens up, it will start playing, likely, in your browser. And what we'd like you to do is watch it, and then when you're done, give, give that little green check mark like Louise suggested so that, um, so that we know that uh, you've read it, and, or you've watched it. And then um, make sure that if, you, if you're having issues with sound or something, just let us know in the chat. If it's not working for you, you can use that link. So let's kick it off with a little video from uh, Mark, sorry, Ron Richards about the culture of thinking. All right, so people are finishing up. Looks like we are pretty much good. Oh, I'm sorry, Peter, it cut off early. Yeah, just a few seconds early. I'm not sure why, but it's the way it goes. Okay. So we, what we were impressed with there was some of the ideals that we've been hearing about for around 21st century learning, about having children become problem solvers and creative and curious. And this sort of relates to the, the um, ideas of inquiry we've been hearing about in the curriculum lately and, and what we're trying to do as teachers. So we really love that as, as capturing um, a, an essence of what it means to um, be focused on children's thinking. So what we thought tonight was that we would start with some of these bigger ideas. Um, why, what kinds of thinking do we want in the classroom and, and what models might we use to help us with those and how could technology fit in there. But what we'd like you to do is if there's anything else that you're thinking about 
or expecting in your when you came tonight? Do you have any questions and that kind of thing that you would that you would type them in the chat, please? And then we'll kind of keep an eye on those and hopefully we'll be able to respond to most or all of your ideas. So just anything that pop into mind, you could go ahead and put that in there as we go. We've been really influenced by a lot of educators um, over the years. And one of them, what you've got here is, is the visiblethinking.org uh, website, which is just such a wealth of great examples. We'll be taking you through some of those. Barry Bennett's work in Beyond Monet and his new book is Graphic Intelligences, also really great. But, um, you know, I ideas for strategies and ideas around framing questions that we've talked about in other webinars, strategies that work from Stephanie Harvey and Ann Goodvis, and um, Dylan Williams' work on formative assessment and what that can look like. So what we like to do, I guess, Peter and I, is take little bits of um, what we like from, from all different approaches and kind of make it eclectic. Sometimes, sometimes we refer to that as, uh, as bricolage, kind of that idea of meshing different ideas together. So we're not necessarily saying that the, the things that we're going to show would be brand new ideas. Um, more of a compilation of of the things that we think are really working in schools and we that we see the benefit from. So that's where we're coming from. So Peter, do you want to talk about uh, a post you wrote recently about this topic of visible thinking? Certainly will. So I'm just going to uh, open an application for you here and share my screen. And this will show you a post that I just wrote yes, uh, maybe two days ago or something like that. I actually, I didn't write this article two, day, two days ago. And I'm trusting you can see that screen. Um, you can scroll through it as, as you wish there. I'm not going to read the whole thing, obviously, to you. But it refers to an article that I wrote in 1986 uh, called Transfers on the Train of Thoughts. Okay, it was pretty close to the 70s, so, you know, get into that kind of metaphor stuff. Uh, we didn't call it visible thinking back then. We called it uh, making thinking explicit. And uh, in this post, uh, you'll see some of, and, and this was actually written for a conference that I ran uh, for the ECHO organization for a special interest group for Logo called Look to the Learner because we were interested in focusing on the learner. And you see that cool graphic there when it's hard to find the learner in there, look to the learner. Um, and um, You'll see some techniques that I developed for kids to make their thinking visible. And it wasn't for purposes of assessment, uh, formative or summative, but really for the uh, purpose of helping kids to have tools with which to think. I really wanted kids to be able to watch the processes of other kids, um, both less experienced and more experienced kids or more expert kids, because you know kids often just see finished products, and that's a huge challenge. So. Uh, you'll see some techniques written about in here called Metaphoria, Watch Me Think, and uh, one called After Bugs, which is kind of a favorite of mine. So uh, at your leisure, you can read through that and, and maybe some of the other posts on the site which are really relevant to this topic as well. There's one in there on uh, metacognition and it's sort of a compilation of a number of posts uh, at, by myself and uh, other stuff that from other sources, obviously, because that's where we get all the stuff from other ideas. And it's uh, really, the, the, the blog is really about getting kids to take charge of their own learning, but also the learning of their peers. So it really is a, uh, about making thinking visible so that you bootstrap everybody in the class up to a higher level of uh, performance and uh, knowledge and thinking. So that's. Um, that's that. Now, Louise, can you take me back? I can. I always forget how to take me back. Thank you very much. Perfect. Okay. Um, any questions about that? Any thoughts? And we'll see a little more about metaphors later. Brenda. Thank you. So what we'd like to do tonight as we move along is to actually take you through some of the routines that we've discovered along the way, mostly from visible thinking. Dot org, and then some of the, uh, he may not have called them routines, but some of those ones that Peter developed with kids um, a little while back. And 
So things that you might use with students, why don't we try them out ourselves? And then we'll sort of expand on other ways we might consider having students think out loud, um, document their thinking, and as, a, as we go along, we'll discuss how the technology might fit. So if you kind of keep the technology piece in the back of your mind, that would be great. When you notice a good fit, let's jump in and in the chat mention it or we'll, uh, we'd love it if you could grab the mic. We'd like it to be a rather organic discussion tonight. And we also have a, a wide range of folks. Some of you are secondary, some of you are elementary, some of you have done some work on critical thinking already with the other webinars, so you'll see some similarities between the visual, um, the visual thinking, um, making thinking visible resources and critical thinking for sure. So let's start with um, the way we might be able to, we might begin to think about synthesizing our thinking. So we're going to ask you a big question. What is thinking? And we'd like what you, you to just spend one minute, so I'm hoping Louise could set the timer for us. For one minute, just think by yourself, how would you describe thinking? What is it to you? And we'll just, I'm just going to stop talking and let you do that. So thank you. What is thinking? Great, and so just like Ma uh, Maria and Janice have done, put down in the chat, take a minute now uh, to record what, what you think thinking is. And what we'd like to encourage you to do is to look back through the chat once you've put in your response and see what other people are saying. Yeah, I love what people are adding in here. So many great ideas around process and um, mulling things around, analyzing, reflecting, um, synthesizing. Takes what's known to something new. That's an interesting way to look at it. Uh, internal and external stimuli. Processing that, Stephen mentioned. Alicia mentions the idea of uh, conceiving an idea, which might include memories, images, reasoning. All right. People still in the chat. Super. Thank you for doing that. Any comments you'd like to make on what you see there, Peter? I'm always amazed at the diversity um, because you know, you you could anticipate what's going to come out, but you really can't uh, can't generate what comes out of people's minds because they just come with their own mindset. That that's what's so gorgeous about making things invisible. Um, so it was interesting what Marie said uh, related to Jan's uh, definition. Uh, Jan said uh, processing an idea, mulling it over, uh, for reformatting it. Um, and manageable form for using, storing, and access. And she also said, so it makes sense to you. And so Marie commented about, uh, you know, maybe that's similar to a computer, and I, and I think it is in many, many parts of it, uh, except for me, the making sense part. I'm not sure a computer could do, except in some fashion, maybe that, uh, maybe it depends how you define making sense, so. Yeah, no, interesting. Okay, cool, thank you. So what we're going to do now is we're going to imagine that we've spent more than just three minutes.
thinking about what is thinking, but imagine that we're students or we're working on a concept or an idea. We're going to try out two of the visible thinking routines. Actually, one that's a visible thinking routine from the book and one that is one of Peter's. So I'm going to explain two. Uh, um, one is called Headlines and one is called Metaphoria. And at the end, after we've explained both of them, um, we're going to ask you to choose one of those types of synthesizing, uh, synthesis activities and, and create um, either a headline or a metaphor for your thinking about thinking. So uh, like some of Barry Bennett's, I'll start with headlines if that's okay with you, Peter. Some of you um, in our past webinar around questioning, we, we talked about Barry Bennett's work around framing questions. And one of the things that headlines does the, this activity is help learners quickly synthesize their current understanding about a topic or an idea. So it's that idea of getting to the heart of the matter and it tells students that noticing big ideas is really important to our learning, to our understanding, but it also lets the teacher capture the thinking of a group at a, at a certain point in time. So when we start into these inquiry units that are pretty, pretty large and we have a big essential question, Sometimes we want to capture the thinking along the way at certain points. So that's, that's what this one is used for. Um, it also really appreciates that idea of different perspectives and different points of view that, that Peter mentioned when we see all these different ways that people express their understanding. So it also makes sure that all your students' voices are heard in a supportive way. So um, that's that technique. Um, and, and what you would do for this one is you would create uh, one sentence, very briefly, that captures your thinking about what is thinking. Um, and so you could be using any of those sort of concepts or ideas that our discussion provided and then create one slogan type of thing. Peter, do you want to go ahead and explain Metaphoria and then we'll let people choose one of those to do. Alrighty. Uh, so uh, Metaphoria started out to be um, a simple sentence starter kind of thing. But uh, what I'm going to do is just share a little video with you uh, in a minute or two, and that encompasses some number of things. So I really love metaphors or analogies or similes uh, or procedural analogies, sometimes they're called, because they are uh, about process, because they really provide kids with mental models with which to think within and across domains. Uh, so sometimes I will provide metaphors and sometimes I want them to create their own. So this is a four minute video or so and it contains a bit of both. Uh, and it also explains uh, this other technique called after bugs, uh, which is the act of seeking of mistakes or bugs in thinking. So now this is a Vimeo video. Uh, I don't know if that's blocked at, uh, at the school or, or at the site for one of you. Um, but Vimeo acts a little differently to YouTube. This video will not self-start. Uh, you'll have to actually click the play button. And, um, and then if you click the green check mark once you're done, we'll be good to go, or good to come back, I guess. So here we go. Thank you. 
Okay, I think we're just about there, Lefty and Catherine. Hope you're done. I know Alicia's watching on her phone. Are there any questions about that video? Type them in the chat or grab the mic. We could talk about that forever, so we probably don't want to do that. <laughs> Especially those with such a love logo. Okay, so let's, uh, we're going to have to move on here. So if you didn't get a chance to finish watching it, do you have the link? Um, so Brenda, do you want to just uh, explain then the task using the thinking is and thinking deeply is? Thanks. Thanks, Peter. So what we'd like you to do to try this out is to think about what you had put in the chat and what others had put in the chat about what thinking is. You've now um, heard about using the headlines technique or you could create a metaphor. So in, in maybe in block caps, if you have some energy, and I know it's 8 o'clock at night, the week before March break, but um, if you if you could write your headline or your metaphor um, in block caps in the in the chat, it's not doesn't have to be perfect. Remember, it's just capturing a notion right now about what you think thinking is. So it might start thinking is or thinking deeply is. Okay. Um, and Janice has a question there. Right. They have to yes, and I think that's one of the powerful things about this is that the student is creating the metaphor exactly. So um, let's go ahead and have people, if you wish, try to think of something. What would you say? Thinking is a headline or a metaphor?
Anyone hear me? I don't think we're hearing Brenda. Let me know in the chat if uh, anyone else is having that problem. Sorry, I'm just giving people time to think and post their headline or metaphor. Sorry about that, Brenda. I looked over and I saw your mic symbol was on still, and I thought, oh no, her mic's on, but we're not hearing anything. Sorry for the interruption. Continue thinking. You have me still, luckily. Her mic's on, nobody's home. <laughs> yeah, her mic's on, but nobody's home. That would be a good headline <laughs> for the week before March break. No, I would I would knock on wood about not losing my sound, but you know what'll happen, my dog might bark. So look at these amazing cap these amazing headlines or sentences or synthesis synthesis syntheses of ideas. And imagine if you will being able to capture this throughout a unit, maybe a different um, signpost along the way, and then being able as a teacher just to observe those ideas and be able to intervene. So for example, when Peter wrote, thinking is something that happens to me, I don't always do it. That, you know, is such an interesting statement because it makes me wonder, are we ever not thinking? Can I turn my thinking off? You know, Leslie says, Thinking is like her boys building something, one peg at a time. So she's that, that whole idea of uh, it not coming to us all at once, but little pieces. Also, Martine, uh, Martine, I'm not sure if I'm saying that name right, um, but being like gears, things working together, fast, slow. So the idea of slow thinking and fast thinking came out there. Um, combining old thoughts with new thoughts from Sharon. Like these are such rich, um, pieces of information for us as teachers to look at where our students are with each in a, in a point in time. So um, it'd be great to be capturing those and posting them. And of course, there's where you know technology can come into play. So thank you for very thank you for doing that. So that's one you might try. Um, what what we found was we got got into the book visible thinking is they they categorize their routines, they call them, into three different areas. So one's for introducing and exploring ideas, some for synthesizing and organizing ideas. That was an example of headlines or metaphoria would fall into that. And then routines for digging deeper into ideas. <clears throat> and what's interesting is that they don't, um, they call them routines, but the authors you know, mentioned that they might have called them tools, they might have called them strategies, but they cho chose that word routines very specifically because they really feel that these, these think kinds of thinking processes should be um, really woven into the fabric of the classroom. So they should become, become routine in the classroom. Sometimes they're used in isolation, sometimes they're con uh, combined with others. And it's interesting to note that like the Critical Thinking Consortium folks, they advocate for these routines to be used in conjunction with good content. So not isolated, but really embedded in our curriculum as we know it. So that, that makes me feel good as a teacher because I know that when I, I have a lot of curriculum expectations and that's part of my job. I just heard a hand go up. So Peter, do you want to share? So, um we agree we might be controversial and, and contra not contradict each other, but open up a discussion on certain items. I don't necessarily agree with uh, with Garfield and uh, the Thinking Consortium on that specifically. I think that often it's a great way if it's embedded within the uh, within the curriculum. But sometimes I do believe, depending on the kid, depending on uh, the context, depending on a lot of other factors, individual factors. Uh, it may have to be a heuristic that is taught in isolation and then brought to the curriculum afterwards. Otherwise, it can get lost in the in the curriculum and not be understood as a separate entity that can be moved across domains. So it's just something to be aware of. Uh, I, I do believe the other uh, the other thing that they're making a point of here is that they're calling them routines for the reasons Brenda mentioned because it really is about a way of being. Otherwise, like so many other initiatives that we hear about, everything from project-based learning and uh, now inquiry and all this stuff, the danger is that they become, quote, another worksheet or uh, as uh, 
uh, you know the name Brenda, activity trap kind of thing. Um, so these need to become uh, part of the belief structure and philosophy much more deeply embedded than, uh, than just a strategy or tool that you pull out of the toolbox. For sure, thanks. Yeah, they they mention in the book um, not they didn't they don't really want them used as recipes. They but they don't also want them used occasionally. So they, their suggestion is to stick pretty close to some of their suggestions the first time you do it, and then um, you know get used to them, become fluent with the routines, and then modify and change um, change as as you wish. I just wanted to address uh, Jan's question there. Uh, she's asked about the challenges posed by diversity of time requirements in the classroom. Some students seem to need so much time in order to think, way longer than we have, and, and it is heartbreaking. Uh, I'm uh, obviously, you know, there are so many ways to think about this, and uh, you know, curricular demands are are challenging these days. Um, one, I don't have a real answer, Jan. I mean, I, I guess one of my perspectives is that uh, online spaces will often provide uh, certain kids longer time to think uh, than what might happen in a classroom, um, where in a classroom it's sort of all happening uh, in real time. Isn't really the issue, but or it is one of one of the challenges um, because kids you want to move on kind of thing. I know, I, I think we do too much. I think we attempt to do way too much. I mean, that's really, if you want, you know what, that's really my answer. My answer is we try to do way too much and I'm not sure how to get around that except try and consider uh, your evaluation on uh, general expectations rather than the specifics and spend time going deeply with kids into things that are really relevant to those individual kids once you, you know, give a good look into their eyes and try not to break their hearts and understand that that's what they need and uh, you know work your way around the challenges of uh, we're being recorded aren't we so I should behave of the curricular demands how's that and I think one um, one of the things that um, sort of comes to mind when I'm thinking of this is the idea like Peter said of using some of the tools we have the technological tools to, to build in that um, that time uh, that that time break that you get, or the even just the ability to go back and revise. So um, we're going to watch uh, Mark Church, who's one of the authors, actually use this headlines technique in his class, and he does it. I mean, he's being filmed to do this, right? So he does it with his whole class. But I thought um, as I was watching it that. You wouldn't necessarily need to do that. You could probably give kids time to do that over the course of a day, or even give them the option to go back and, and adjust what they've done. So I think that's one of the beauties of these kinds of approaches is that it's, it's just capturing a moment in time. It's, the expectation is that we're always going to be clarifying our thinking, constructing new understandings. We're going to be changing what we think as we move through a unit of study, let's say, for example. So let's. Let's watch him. That's right, the idea that the conversation is never over. And this is where I think our arts colleagues, of course, have that nailed because nothing is ever really completed according to the, the artist until, uh, until, until it's maybe hanging in a gallery. And even then, they probably don't feel like it's complete. So I'm going to well, show I, you. I, just Sorry, another point, Brenda, if I may. Just the, uh, you know, I, I, when you talk about diversity, I mean, you know, I, I think of different. Uh, you know, you think of introverts and extroverts as one obvious place. And Susan Cain wrote this beautiful book, Quiet, which you can get a hold of and, and look at that. And then, you know, one of the other challenges is so many cultural differences where, um, where cultures just respond differently to, uh, to speaking, uh, you know, on the fly uh, versus reflective moments. Uh, there's another great book that you should consider, Jan and others. It's called uh, From Campfire to Holodeck. I'll put that in the uh, in the chat in a minute, but uh, you know that's uh, what's his name. David Thornburg talks about 
the cave as being a very important part of every classroom, that place where you can just go and have time to reflect and so forth. And he talks about, you know, three other areas, campfire, the watering hole, the cave and, and life sort of project based learning. So uh maybe we can talk offline about that if you're interested sometime. I'll put that in the chat. Sorry, Brenda, thank you. Okay, I'm hoping you can hear me because I'm starting to have my mic issues that I've had before. Um, and I can't also use the chat right now. So lovely. Hopefully Peter got that text that I just sent him. Um, so I can't post the next link in um, because I can't access my chat. But maybe Peter, could you go ahead and pop in the link for the Annie Fetter video and we'll watch that next? Peter, you go ahead with that. I just uh, went back into the web tour. And Peter, I also can't turn the page on the slide. So if you could do that, that'd be great. OK, I just started the video, so you can.
Don't forget to put the green check mark. Okay, in the interest of time, uh, we're going to just move on here. Hoping most couple of you aren't quite finished, but uh, okay, um, I started that video before Brenda actually got to set it up, but she was having tech issues, so I apologize for not setting it up properly. Brenda, do you want to take it from here? Are you all good? Sure. I think you can hear me. If, if not, you'll let me know. So this was a big um, this was a big aha for me this year. When I first saw this video it was last May. And this has been kind of, when you talk about what thinking is, this has been kind of one of the big ideas that have been just mulling around in my head since May, and it just keeps coming back to different things. So when I stumbled on uh, with Peter, this the Making Thinking Invisible book, it just all came back to me. So I'd love to, what I was going to do there was one of the routines with you folks. Um, we were going to try a see, think, and wonder routine where you have students or people first look and just observe what do you see, what do you think is happening, and then later you ask questions. So we might not uh, might not work just the same way, but what did you think about that video? Maybe you could grab the mic and did it appeal to you? Were there certain things that were ahas for you? Um, any of the points you make resonate? Let us know what you think. Go for it, Janice. I'm a teacher librarian, and I often have teachers come in just because they need a change of space. And it's mind-boggling to me how often teachers will reteach stuff that the kids already know. And they always seem to act like they're teaching it to the kids for the first time. So if it's um, like, some of the reading strategies, they act like the kids have never been asked to connect or visualize or um, met, use their metacognition skills um, in math. They'll say, oh, well, you know, they don't know this yet. But really, if you look at the curriculum, they've been doing those things since grade two, grade three, grade four, grade five. But each teacher starts again, and they say, well, they didn't know it, so I have to teach them. And almost never do they ever do any kind of pre-assessment or any kind of, well, what do you know already? The only time I can ever remember it being done routinely is when people used to do pre-tests and spelling. But other than that, um, I find that teachers almost never do any kind of assessment to see what do the kids know already and, and what is it they're curious about. I so agree with you there, and, and I even love the way that Annie Fetter just calls it noticing. You know, what do you notice? And how much information as teachers that we could get from just that question. And the other big aha for me when watching this was what Alicia said there about just it being a statement. Uh, let's, let's go on to her point next. but. Even, even for science and phys ed, like Stephen said, and Leslie said that maybe I do the thinking for the kids, but by, by actually asking them what they're noticing and having them record that, they are sharing with each other the things that they see. And I think that that's one of the things that was a big aha for me was that how much I could, how much I could leverage that, the fact that some of my stronger students or think, students that think differently by asking them what they're noticing and having them share that with everyone, how much that's going to help the learning of the whole group. And um, what, what Alicia noticed, I didn't notice the first time through, actually, Alicia. I didn't notice that she made it a statement and took the question piece away, because uh, I, I, the next time I watched it, I noticed that. And I thought for our, for our math, um, where we have a big focus in math on our, at, our, at our board, and what we loved when we unpacked this video was the fact that how much kids could teach each other by what they notice on, on something and what's important to notice and what isn't and all of that. So I just thought this was a really great routine or strategy um, that you could use a, around having kids help each other. Um, it's, not, it's not that deficit based, exactly. 
and there is no right or wrong. Someone mentioned that in the chat. There is no right or wrong about what you notice about something. Yes, some things might be more relevant to notice than others, but there is no right or wrong. So I just, I urge you to go back and watch that a couple more times. I just loved it. So then that would, you could go on from seeing and thinking and then to wondering. So, I, uh, okay, that's either Janice, I think, first, and then Peter, go for it. I think maybe Jan just didn't uh, take her hand down, but she can interrupt me. She knows me well enough. Um, just a, a meta piece on that uh, Annie Fetter piece. That was uh, um, an Ignite session, so that's why it went kind of rapidly. Um, an Ignite session is something you might even want to try with your kids. It's, it's a brilliant little technique, either that or a Pecha Kucha. So uh, an Ignite session, I believe, is 20 slides at 15 seconds per slide, and the slides automatically advance. Pecha Kucha or Pechachka is uh, 20 slides, 20 seconds per slide, and again, they automatically advance. So uh, you know, these are run at conferences uh, fairly often, um, and so they're kind of fun and uh, challenging to do. Great, thank you. So um, here's an example of one of the authors of the book using headlines in the classroom and, and uh, one of the things I just love about watching this is seeing all of the things that he's got around in his classroom that are examples of thinking. But um, So we're going to think about, um, to watch this and then think about uh, how we could do some of these, these types of things with technology, I think. That's where we're at. I'm a little mixed up here right now, but that's okay. We will move on. So I'm going to pop that uh, link in the chat. And I'm going to try to web tour us, and hopefully I don't get frozen. This will be YouTube, so it will start really quickly for you, and then you can give us the green check mark. Peter, you don't happen to have that link fast, do you? Brenda, I've got it. And know what? Let me start the web tour. I don't know if that might be something that okay. uh, overloads things at your side. So let's go light. Okay, give us Here a good check mark when it's finished then, guys. Try that again, Louise. Is everybody having that problem? Yes. Uh, let me try. Do you want me to try it? Sure. I'm going to go back out to whiteboard and your turn. Yeah, that's just, it's jumping around crazily. Okay, in the interest of time, I think uh, maybe we'll just move on there. Um, Brenda, do you want to explain the, the little mix-up there, as you explained to me? 
Okay, so when I froze, we got we got ahead of ourselves and we did things in the wrong order. But um, so of course, right after we had done our headlines and metaphoria, we wanted to share with you uh, Mark's uh, use of that in the classroom. So that was YouTube. If you do um, some googling around visual thinking routines, you'll get a lot of little snips of teachers, often the authors of that book. Um, demonstrating the routines in their classroom. So I think you'll find that pretty valuable. So other ways you could do headlines or metaphoria, you could have those paper headlines like he did. We were thinking of a couple of other things and we'd love it if you'd enter in the chat other ways you might do it. If, if, if a use of technology kind of popped into your mind, I immediately thought of drawing. It wouldn't have to be a sentence. It could be an image um, that captured that thinking. Um, it could be a tableau because that's in essence what you're doing when you're capturing a photograph using your your bodies um, of, of a, a main idea. How about Twitter? The idea of having 140 characters to create your headline and post it would be a great way. You could then use Storify or you could even just search based on a hashtag from your classroom and get everybody's headline to appear. Um, then there are other tools that we use such as Lino or Walwish or Padlet, those are all versions of a type of electronic sticky note that a student could go over to a center in your classroom or use their own device and create their headline um, to synthesize their information. So I'm just going to go on and then I'm going to digest what Madame DuPont is saying there. Um, so we did that one accidentally. Yeah, we did that one accidentally. So we were moving into the second grouping of routines, which is introducing and exploring our, the first um, group, introducing and exploring routines. That was a way to do it. We wanted to share with you some examples of how you might do this in, in school. Um, a placemat activity like this with the visuals. Um, you could do this in a Google Doc. You could also, I, I actually saw oh, um, when I was doing some research for this, someone using Socrative, which is an app that students could use on their own devices, and you could change your quizzes to um, be a think, see, think, wonder. Here's something that we see a lot of, especially in our younger grades, our, especially in my board at least, um, the kindergartens are really working on documentation. So we see a lot of this kind of thing out in hallways or the whole a side of the classroom being used as a see, think, wonder board. And notice the sticky notes there. This is really rather a dynamic space. So it's not, not to just for students to post ideas once and then leave them there and you never go back to it. You can see that kids are adding information or they're clarifying understandings or they're answering some of the questions. So they're really um, using this as a, as a dynamic uh, visualization of their thinking. Padlet is another one, right? Uh, voice threads would work really nicely for see, think, and wonder because you could set it up for each of those pages. Today's meet would work. So you guys have a lot of, I think once we have the idea of where we want to go with the thinking, it's actually much easier to pick a tool that would work. Okay, so let's move on. Um, Peter, you're going to take us away with um, another kind of routine that's used for synthesizing and organizing ideas. Right. Now, those of you who know me well uh, have gone through this uh, kind of stuff before, but maybe coming at it with, uh, with a new, uh, from a new perspective, revisiting it, uh, tiptoeing back through it differently uh, with uh, the, the lens of visible thinking might, uh, might be worthwhile for you. So, um, back in the 80s, I worked uh, on the CISO project, the Computer Supported Intentional Learning Environment uh, project out of OISE, and developed uh, something independent to their, based on their ideas, and it was called Thinking Land. Uh, it was done in HyperCard at the time. Um, but it was really getting um, kids to think uh, in these ways, think about their, how their thinking has changed, to think about uh, they're thinking in terms of knowledge, what is knowledge, what's declarative knowledge, what's procedural knowledge, what's metacognitive knowledge, what are their beliefs, what are their opinions, uh, and then to really uh, think about uh, thinking as a highly valued activity and that they were indeed thinkers. 
Um, so um, Thinking Land uh, was a journal writing environment. It later in 2000, when I worked in Montreal, became a, a program called Journal Zone, uh, which is no, which is not available for sale. So um, because it never flew uh, well, because like has been said in the chat, uh, most people don't really get into this stuff too deeply. <laughs> so <laughs> blogs came along and sort of killed it. But the point being, you can use all sorts of tools still, both paper and online. Uh, to do this. So we focused on uh, a metacognition, uh, basically planning, reflecting, uh, planning, monitoring, and reflecting, but doing it in a public space, doing it in a public environment where kids would work together. So these are some of the planning starters that we uh, used with kids. And in the, in the software, basically, they would choose one, click on it, and it would drop it into their journal, and then they would complete the sentence uh, with the number of sentences or paragraph about their project, uh, you know, some project-based learning initiative that they were engaged in. Um, and similarly, we did reflection starters. So at the end of the work period for the day, or at the end of the unit, or at the end of the research, they could reflect. Uh, we did it mostly, um, you know, after the end of each, I don't know, day or two, or little work piece, whatever. Um, and like those one, like that uh, board that you saw on the previous slide, we had we often had class meetings or online space meetings where kids would where you would ask kids to go back through their thinking uh, and see what's been said. Hey, kids, go back through the the journals of your group members and see where you see that anybody has changed their plan and try and figure out why they've changed their plan. So this gets kids to tiptoe back through and revisit uh, their thinking in those ways. One of the things that we discovered was that kids uh, are, you know, as uh, Madame Dupont has said, they don't want to think. They just, so they want to play school. So, hey, if, I, if I'm given a sentence starter, I'm going to finish it with just a sentence. Click, and the sentence and done. Well, you know, if you have the culture in the classroom, then you can get to these higher levels and kids start to really fall into loving thinking. And so they, we encourage elaboration triggers. So I have changed my plan. Uh, I have changed my plan uh, to do such and such and such. And then it would come to an elaboration trigger, click on it. Uh, in that case, I better go back and revisit the, the, the. Or I look forward to, therefore I look forward to blah, 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 you know. Uh, I didn't get as far as I planned because I found my topic too difficult. Um, and as a result of that, I better, you know, change my ideas or whatever it would be. Um, and then this one is really dealing with how do you get kids to engage in deep discussions? Because what typically happened in those environments is you got a lot of social comments. And as we know, kids are great with computers, not. They're great with socializing on computers. So they would say things like, hey, great idea. Hey, I love what you're doing. Um, you know, that kind of thing. But it wasn't very substantive. Didn't really bootstrap the, uh, the thinking up to a higher level. So, uh, we put in these comment starters. Uh, I agree with you because, or whatever. So one kid, for example, had said, "I'm going to study potato production in Prince Edward Island," and she, you know, she put that in her journal. And Larissa came along and said, um, "That's that's a great topic, but have you thought about the fact that we studied acid rain all last month? Has that had any impact on potato production?" So this was grade five or six. And so again, that's just sort of got the kid out of going just to do regular research, regular research, uh, and copying information and sort of reformatting and pasting it into, a, you know, a knowledge telling kind of scenario. This actually had them construct new knowledge because then I had to synthesize several bits of information and research uh, sources. So that's the essence of that. Um, these journal starters um, are the ones that we made up, but in fact. Um, the software, and I would encourage you to do so, is to uh, try and get kids to generate these kinds of sentence starters as well. They get more buy-in. So there's a quick tour through the uh, journal kind of